I want to thank Liz for her kind words. Um, I, really, it's only going to be downhill from there. <laughs> so uh, I'm very glad to be here at your school, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me. I get to come occasionally and work with fathers here, and, uh, and often to speak with parents from time to time. One of the things that really um, makes a great impression on me about the Green Meadows School is in my travels, I meet people come up to me and say, oh, I went to Green Meadow. And uh, these are adults, adult parents, but they're neat people. <laughs> well, I was out at the Waldorf School in Santa Monica recently. A young man came up to me and said, oh, I went to the Green Meadows School. And uh, you're from Washington, and do you know so-and-so from Washington? She was in my class. I said, oh, yeah. I, I taught her son. Uh, well, I had two parents in my last class who went to Green Meadow. And um, it's wonderful. Uh, at the Steiner School, there was a young man who was in the parent group, uh, parent organization, just dynamic, warm, kind of person you just want to know. He said, oh yeah, I went to Green Meadow School. So your school has done this wonderful work of educating children who grew up to be very special adults. And that's the work that's going on today for your children, helping them become the kind of people that when you meet them, you think there's something different, something special that they've been given. And uh, there's a warmth and a vibrancy. It's wonderful to see. So I'm happy to relay that to you, that your school is out there and your graduates make a difference, noticeable difference. Now, I wanted to say a tiny bit about the work that I, say a tiny bit about the organization that I helped to start and that I work for, and how the Nova Institute started. Uh, it's a very small nonprofit. You can underline small. Uh, but it's good, we do good work. And it started years ago. And forgive me if you've heard me say this in the past, but there was an article, I think it must have been in the Washington Post, because I don't get the New York Times, and it was about a New York City public school principal, Deborah Meyer, who um, had, a, she was the principal of a school called Central Park East. And she was given a MacArthur grant for her innovative work at her school. And I'm always intrigued by the MacArthur grants because you can't apply for them. They have to find you. And they seem to find some interesting people. And so I read on. And she was commended for three things at her school. She was commended for realizing that children learn more uh, effectively when classes aren't just 45 minutes. So she doubled the size of all the lessons at Central Park East. And then she um, decided that students learn more effectively when curriculum subjects are integrated. So if you teach science through art, or history through music, or math through writing, students learn better. And she learned and, and understood that schools run better when teachers are involved in the decisions that affect their students in their classrooms. She had the first site-based managed school. And so I read this and I thought, doesn't anybody pay attention? Because Waldorf schools have been doing this forever. <laughs> and, and then I got that morose feeling that I can get easily, you know, like, oh, woe is me, no one really notices what we do. But then I stopped myself and I thought, well, this is perfect. This is the way it's supposed to be. Because the ideas that are at the basis of Waldorf education, they were ahead of their time. By 70, 80 years ahead of their time. But like ideas, always, they have a time of their own. And there comes a time with progressive ideas when they start to take root in many places. And that was what was happening in Waldorf, with Waldorf education. You started to see things in the public sector that replicated what we did in our schools. So 
I'd see an article on the front page of the Washington Post about a teacher in Washington, D.C., who stayed with his class for five years and how effective that was as a teaching innovation. Same thing in Baltimore. And how in the inner city, young people need the continuity of having the same teacher. Someone they can depend on in a life that is subject to so many dramatic changes. So that was one thing I saw. I live in Montgomery County. It is not the hotbed of progressive education by any standard. But we have three arts-based schools, elementary schools, where they teach all subjects through art. And so you see in so many places ideas taking root that really parallel what we do in our schools. And I thought, we should notice that. We should pay attention. We should make common cause with people doing good things. So that's what we started out to do in the Nova Institute. And that's almost 20 years ago. And it's been very rewarding for me because part of that time, my assignment was just to find out what people are doing in education. And that's a great thing to see because the more you read, the, more, the clearer it is that what a Waldorf education sets out to do is absolutely what's needed for tomorrow. That's just clear. I've just been reading this book by Daniel Pink called When. New book, it's on the, up on the bestseller list. And what he talks about are the studies that show how much better students do when they have a break in the morning. And how much better they do when that break takes them outside. And how much better they do when they have two breaks like that in the day. Right. The documentation, the two recesses, make it so that students test as if they went to school three weeks longer during the school year than if they don't have those breaks. Right. The things that are just part and parcel of Waldorf education are confirmed in so many ways. And so what is the conviction that Waldorf education is even better than I thought when I was sold on it when I became a teacher. It's just grounded in substantiated research. Good work. Now, what makes it so that people recognize the good work? Why aren't people just beating down our doors? Because we have an education that really prepares children for a world we can't predict. Right? It just does. In so many ways. And that's because our schools are different. And you know they're different. You know they're different when you're at a dinner party and someone says, where do your children go to school? And you say, the Waldorf school. And they say, what kind of school is that? And you're stopped. How do you explain it? Right? Or you're stopped in the supermarket and someone says, you children go to the Waldorf school? I saw that decal on the back of your car. What kind of school is that? Right? It's hard to answer. What do we say? It's a creative school. It's a a child-centered school, it's, a, it's an imaginative, warm place with a community. It's a, you know, because the truth of it is, what makes it different is that it's a spiritual school. And yet that's the hardest thing to explain of all. What makes our school a spiritual school? Now, I want to read something to you. It's a... An excerpt that I've used when I work with teachers it goes like this. Humanity has inherited much that is called into question today. Thus, the numerous current crises and demands of our time, how many of these matters occupy the world's attention? Social questions, women's questions, various educational concerns, health debates, questions of human rights, and so on. 
Human beings are trying to come to terms with these issues in varied ways. There are countless numbers of people who appear with one or more remedies or programs to solve or at least partially solve one or another of them. And looking at these things with deeper vision, one can only feel that we are trying today to meet the demands of modern life with means that are utterly inadequate. Right. And I, I think that's borne out by the front page of our paper. Right. We just are not meeting the demands of our time. We haven't been. We know that. We all know that. And what the person goes on to say is that in order to begin to solve the problems that we face, we must look at issues from a deeper perspective. And this was written by Rudolf Steiner in 1909. It could have been written yesterday, couldn't it have? Right? We're facing the same problems. So how do we do this work? How do we look at things from a deeper perspective? How do we look at education from a deeper perspective? And how do we look at it from a spiritual point of view? So for years we've always accepted throughout our society that there is a similarity between children education and the nurturing of plants right we call our first schools nurseries right we call them kindergartens we see teachers turning the soil and the of the fertile ground of a child's mind and planting seeds that we hope will take root we see teachers watching benevolently the way a gardener does for the health of a child to see whether the soil is rich enough, whether the plant gets enough water, whether it gets enough light, whether it thrives, whether there's health. Good teachers watch children in just that way. Right? So we accept this notion that the plant is a good metaphor for the child. But what we believe in Waldorf education is that the plant has to be seen differently. We have to invert it. Right, that's what Rudolf Steiner said to the teachers. Have it so that the roots of the plant are up above. Because the child is rooted in the heavenly. And then understand that children grow down to earth. And that's our work. To help our children grow down into this life. And then to take hold of their life and their place in the world. And with a little good fortune, they will love the world and learn in the world and connect with the people they meet. That's our hope. So what is it that draws our children down into this life? Because honestly, we see it today, there are children who do not want to enter life. Right? The whole rise of autism and the Asperger syndrome, spectrum children, they're all children who hold back, who don't want to connect with other people, who don't want to step into life. I don't know what makes that pervasive reluctance, whether it's fear or hesitancy or just a glimpse of how complex our world is, right? But something is keeping our children from entering into the world fully. Not all of our children, thank goodness, but more than ever before, right? right? That's what the statistics show. More children than ever before. And so, if I look for ways, how do we bring healing to our children and through our children, healing into the world, right? Because that's, that's our job now whether we want to accept that assignment or not, because it's not easy, but we know it's necessary, then we should know that for this child that's coming down to earth, there are three different things they're going to need. They're going to need, as young children, to feel deeply that the world is good. That invites them 
That's the work of our preschool, to convey to little children that the world is good. And for those of you who were sold on Waldorf education because you stepped into the preschool and felt this place is different, it was the goodness that conveys that. The goodness of the natural materials that are part of that classroom. The curtains that gently let in the light. The lighting that is soft and, and soothing. The rugs that are on the floor that are made of natural fibers. Or the, the wooden toys or the healthy snacks. Or the health-giving routine of children. I mean, how does a preschool teacher do that to have 10 four-year-olds at a table and they actually wait until they're, everyone's served before they eat. That's a miracle. <laughs> when I work with the dads, they say, just tell me how it is that in that classroom, Miss Carol just sings a song and all the children start to clean up. Right? They want to bottle that. Right? Take it home and teach me that song and that'll make my life so much easier. Right? But it's this pervasive goodness and the goodness that the teachers know that everything they do in the presence of the child should be worthy of imitation. So they speak gently. I know people feel our Waldorf voices are fake. <laughs> but it's fake in a good cause. Right? Yeah, that should be our morning prayer. Dear God, don't let the real me shine forth here. Right? Let me be a better person for these children. Right? And so we do that so that they can imitate us because what we know is that in this first stage the children believe the world is good and because they do they have no buffer between what they see and what they imitate they don't mediate their experience they don't say oh my mother's not having such a good day today I won't imitate that <laughs> right or my father didn't really mean to use that word in my presence I won't say that word, right? We know that, you know, people say, well, children don't imitate as much as they used to, but you say one thing in front of your child you don't want them to imitate, and they imitate really strongly, right? So we know that, that it should be worthy of them, and it should be a school situation that's safe, right? Because when we're safe, then we really relax enough to experience things fully. And we want the children to feel safety. The safety comes in knowing that there's a rhythm to the week. And every Monday, we do this, we paint. Or every Tuesday, we bake. Or every Wednesday, we paint. So that they know, little by little, what this world is about. And they relax and enter in. Right. In the grade school, from first grade on, we have a different assignment. What's asked of us is to convey to the children that the world is beautiful. And that's why our Waldorf schools look the way they do. That's why you can walk down the hallway of the grade school and you see all those beautiful drawings and paintings because it's all done through art and through music because we want the children to know that the world is beautiful. But beautiful is much broader than just our assignments. <coughs> beautiful is the countenance of a teacher's face when they meet something a child does that they don't expect or want, and they do it with patience. That's beautiful. Or when a teacher's voice conveys kindness, oh, you spilled your paint again. Right? That's beautiful. I always think that, you know, it's true for us as parents and it's true for us as teachers that we're on a path for sainthood. So I would always ask myself, what would St. Francis do? You know, if someone spilled blue paint on the rug. I think St. Francis would say, oh, that's a beautiful color. Right? It really is. It's a beautiful color. But Mr. Cox, who cleans our room, is not going to like it as much as we do. <laughs> right? So we should clean that up. Could you get water and a bucket? Right? Don't spill it. Mm -hmm. Walk. <laughs> right? 
But that's our job, is to, to meet them, to be beautiful. The room is beautiful, and you see that in the classrooms. But we should surround them with beauty and through the power of imagination, make the world come alive. You know, whenever you speak to people who work in a school, they'll always say how grateful they are to be in the company of children. It really is a rare thing to be with children. Their world is so much fun. I mean, isn't it wonderful that if two people in the same classroom say the same word at exactly the same moment, it's important. You have to say something to, to get rid of the jinx or double jinx. I love children's worlds. You know, the things that, that's important, that are important to them. That's the world I want to live in because it's filled with imagination. And isn't that how we're going to teach them? We're going to teach them through imagination. Now, oh, look at this. I have a blackboard. Mm -hmm. I feel most fortunate. I... Um, You know, in first grade, we get to teach children the alphabet. And I know that children just come to school knowing their alphabet. Right? We have to teach them that because our parents ask the children to say their ABCs when they're four and five. It's not our doing that they've learned it. Our, our, our parents taught them that. So it's, it's understandable because parents have expectations that we have to meet. Uh, or otherwise they're convinced that what they thought all along is true. That we're irresponsible and things like that. But, you know, so we teach them their alphabet. And one of the things that, oh good, you may be able to see this, that I did in my class was I taught them the letter H through the picture of the house. Something like this. Okay. No, I don't have a grass, oh, I do have a grass color. And you teach all the consonants through pictures. And please rest assured that my picture was nicer than this when I did it for children because it sh the world should be beautiful. But you have this where you, you have their picture letter and out of that letter comes an understanding of the letter H and the sound that H makes and words that are made with H. But, but what I knew was that our home or our house, it's really an important place where we're more comfortable than we are anywhere. And when we experience sadness or injury, we head home right, for comforting. So I told the children a story about a child who went wandering off into the woods, went a little farther than they thought they were going to go, and they got lost, and it got dark. And when they turned to head home, they hurried. And when they hurried, they didn't see the branch that was sticking up, they fell. And they scraped a knee, and isn't that an experience that seven and six-year-olds have? Falling, scraping your hands and your knees. We all had it when we were little. And at dark, and in a place where you don't know your way, injuries always hurt more. And so you cry and you wander back, but when you see the lights of your house, you're reassured. And when you open the door and you experience the smells of your house, you're comforted. And when you're met by your parent, then you're healed because you're home. Home changes everything. So I wanted the children to know that it same happens with the letters. You take the S that we learned from the snake and you put it next to the H from the house and it's changed. Right? Doesn't make a sound anymore, now it makes a shh. And you take the C of the cat and you put it next to the H and it doesn't make a cuh sound, it makes a ch sound. They all change. The P changes when it's next to the H, and the T changes when it's next to the H. But it's just in this way that teachers make up these little stories because it's an imaginative way to speak to the heart of children. Now, 
you could think that it's just a simple story, and it is, but to me it represents the way in which I try to remind myself to teach children, which is through imagination and meaning. I want to make meaningful the world of phonics, and I want to do it through a story. I want to do it through a simple story. You know, we, we all know the letter K it comes to us through this picture of the king. We do that as teachers. I think most teachers use the K. And then you can say to children, can you give me a word with the letter K? And children will say, sure. King, it's good. Kitten, very good. Cat, or cup, and then you think, oh my gosh. How do you teach English to children? <laughs> what do I tell them? You know, boys and girls, you know, some of these letters they derive from the Latin, like the C with the sound, or they come from the, you know, the, the German with the K sound. You can't say that to children. So you have to come up with a reason to make it imaginative. So I had to make a, a story up for the children. I said to them, I said, boys and girls, there was a king, and he was... He was hard-pressed to do everything in his kingdom because he was so busy and, uh, and he was divorced. So he didn't have, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said he was a widower and he didn't have anyone to help him. So he was looking for someone to help him and he thought, who would be my trusted helper? Would it be my daughter? Because she's there all the time. She could be my trusted helper or maybe it's my wise counselor or maybe it's my courageous knight who guards the gate. I just don't know who to pick. He had to figure it out. So he decided he knew someone he'd ask. And so he rode all day by horse out to the edge of his kingdom where there was an old woman, an old crone. And he knocked it, came up to her cottage. And she, even before he knocked, was standing at the door waiting for him. And she said, I know why you've come. You've come to find out who your trusted helper should be. Now the king was amazed. And so he came to her and she said, come inside. And she took him to a table and there she had a crystal ball. She looked into the crystal ball and she said, the one who meets you when you come home, that's going to be your trusted helper. The king was satisfied. He believed her. And so he turned, got back on his horse, and rode all the way home. It took him a long time, and when he got back, it was late. It was dark, and there was no courageous knight to greet him at the gate. He had to let himself in, came to the castle, and the castle was dark. His daughter had gone to bed. Counselors were all tired, and he thought, was the old woman wrong? Then he went to what was left of the fire to warm his hands, and just down to warm them with the last embers, he felt something touch the back of his leg. And it was, it was the castle cat. And then he realized that the cat was going to be his helper. And so we drew the cat. And you can see the back of the cat gives us our new letter. And I said to the children, you see the cat is going to give us our new letter. And they said, oh, I can see it, Mr. Petrus, it's a C. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, good. And if you ever hear the K sound and you don't see the king, just know that he was too busy. <laughs> and so the cat is helping him out. <laughs> and, you know, so you just want to do that with children because it makes it all come alive. And when we teach them in a way where it comes alive, then we keep their vitality. And isn't that what we want? We want our children to stay fresh and lively and playful. You can't say enough about playful. It's really the mark of genius. Geniuses are playful. And it keeps them young. We want to keep our children young for years. 
We want them to keep playfulness into old age. Keeps them young. They say that the, the best leaders in business are playful. And they stay young at heart. They have a biological term for that called neoteny. The ability of a species to stay young into old age. Playfulness does that. We want to teach them in a playful way, but we want to teach them in a sound way. So we want to make sure that our children know their phonic under phonemic understandings, and we want to make sure that they know that the K and the C make the K sound right from the early grades. Now often people will say, oh, your child goes to the Waldorf school? That's the place where they don't teach reading. <coughs> right? But it's not true. It really isn't. What I always tell people in Washington, D.C., is that you know what it's like downtown. Well, you see what it's like at the Tappan Zee Bridge. You've got cranes everywhere. Right? In Washington, D.C., down by the waterfront, we have cranes everywhere. We're not building bridges. We're building high-rises, large apartments, large expensive apartments. And what we know in Washington is that whenever you see a crane, there's an excavation next to it. And it's usually a pretty deep excavation. And what we know is that the deeper the excavation, the higher the building is that's going to come from that. And we have patience because it can take a long time and you see nothing. You just see people go in and work down there and you don't see anything above the ground. Our teaching of reading is like that because we create a strong foundation of literacy. We help children love language. We help them love words. We help them feel that the letters are their friends and the sounds are familiar to them and that they live in poetry and tongue twisters. I had a boy in my first grade years ago who came up to me and he said, you know what my favorite word is? My favorite word is champion. It's a beautiful word, right? It's from the French. Beautiful word. He's a poetry professor now. He right? teaches at UC Davis. Wonderful poet. Wonderful professor. That love of language starts in that foundation where we help them through this multi-dimensional way we teach to learn their letters. Through running them, through modeling them, through painting them, through singing them, through reciting them, through poetry. We work with auditory learners, we work with visual learners, we work with kinesthetic learners. You meet the needs of the children, the different children, in a multi-dimensional approach because we want them to learn in a lively way, because we want it to touch their hearts. The grade school is all about the feeling life of children, and it should be rich. It should be a rich feeling life. Now, you get to the later grades, we're gonna teach science in a way that touches their hearts. Right? The story I like to tell, and please forgive me if I've told this in a room that you've been in before, is that I remember a lesson that I learned from a Waldorf teacher named Dorothy Hara, who taught at the Steiner School in New York. And she was a master teacher, and someone must have convinced her to write down her lessons, and they put them into little books. And they're really good books. Teachers love them. Nature stories, and math lessons, and English lessons, and just great. And one of the ones that she did that I just loved was a, a, a science lesson in the fourth grade when you teach the human and animal block that you want to teach them about the eagle. And she does this description of the eagle where she takes the children on an imaginary journey. And I wanted to do the same thing with my children. And I wanted to tell them this story in a similar way to her. But I had to do it... Um, an introduction first. I had to ask the children something, and it was a perfect fourth grade question I asked them. I asked them, who's the fastest child in our class? Now, you may not know this, but fourth graders divide the world. They know the fastest child, they know the best drawer, they know who's strongest. They know what they do that. That's why we teach them fractions at this age, because they're all they're into dividing everything into parts. 
That's, a, that's just what they're about. And so I said, who's the fastest? And they said, oh, the fastest child in the class is Nathan. Well, I said, who's the second fastest? They said, Adi is the second fastest. She's almost as fast as Nathan. And I said, the third? And they said, oh, Cameron. And they just had this scoped out. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. How long do you think it's going to take Nathan to run from right outside our classroom, across the playground, and back? And they started arguing. My class could argue. Children today argue really well. Did you, you notice that? So, I think it'll take 51 seconds. So we said, no, that's ridiculous. That's much too long. I think it'll take 27 seconds. And, and then we argued and we argued and we argued, put all the numbers up. And we said, okay. And this is where I knew my lesson was going to become memorable. I said, Nathan, you can climb out our classroom window. <laughs> We're on the first floor. So, and when you, you're going to stand there. And when I say go, you're going to run across the playground and you come all the way back. Now, what I knew is that Every fourth grade has a child with a watch with a timer, right? <laughs> they time your stories, right? That was 11 minutes, Mr. Petrash. That's you know, a little long, 11 minutes and 18 seconds, right? So we found out who could time it. Nathan ran, he ran all the way back, 32 seconds. Adia ran, she came all the way back, 35 seconds. And then Cameron ran, came all the way back, 37 seconds. The kids were absolutely right. And then I disappointed all the others because I didn't let anybody else climb out the window. <laughs> and then I said, okay, but is there a way that you can get from our classroom to that fence and back more quickly? Now, everybody was a little bit nonplussed except one boy in the front whose hands shot right up. And I realized I hadn't put the question to him right. I hadn't said no machine. And I said, Stefan, no machine. He said, oh, I was going to say motorcycle. <laughs> and so his hand went down. Then his hand went back up. And I said, what, do you, what is it, Stefan? He said, bicycle. I said, no, bicycle's a machine. His hand went back down. He was done. So he, no more from him and no more from the other kids. And then one of the girls in the back said, I, I can do it. I said, really? She said, yes, I can get there more quickly with my eyes. Mm -hmm. I look at the wall. I look at the fence, and I look at the wall, and I'm back, right? That's a really good answer. It was the one I was hoping for. And I said, well, Gretchen, that's really good, but what if I said the first grade playground? You can't see that from our window. How can you get to the first grade playground and back? And she couldn't think of it, but the girl next to her said, in my imagination, I can imagine the wall, I can imagine the playground. I can imagine being back. It's really, it's really good. That's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine we're all outside our school, up in the air, looking down at our playground. Look, there are the basketball courts, right? Let's all start moving toward the first grade playground in the air. Now look down, there are the trees. There's the first grade playground. Let's keep going. We went all the way across the Potomac River. We imagined that we went over Virginia and West Virginia and Kentucky, and we imagined our way all the way to the Mississippi and beyond. We went across the Great Plains, and then we came to the Rockies. And we described the Rockies as beautiful, jagged, snow-covered peaks. And while we were doing that, I said to the children, let's stop here, let's look up. Do you see that crag that's sticking out? Let's all go up to that crag. And we went up there, and then we d I described what we would see standing there. This bird's nest, this very large bird's nest, six feet across with branches as thick as your wrist. And then I described the little babies that were in it. And I described the mother eagle that came in, how you could hear her wings, how long her wings were, how in her talon she held a fish, and how she would pull strips off and feed the little baby, eaglets. And then the father who comes and lands and how his wings are about eight feet across, right? From the end of one desk to the end of another child's desk, that big. And how an eagle weighs only about 12 pounds because they're filled with air. Their bones are hollow. Their feathers are hollow. They even have little pockets of air in their bodies. And then how the father and mother eagle return to this crag always. This is their home. They mate for life and their nests permanently here. And then how the father flies 
up into the currents of the air and rises on the warm currents and then how it can see something so far away and drop in an instant and then Dorothy Hara would say to her children do you know where you're like an eagle it's in your mind in your power of imagination you can soar to great heights in your thinking you can move from one place to another in an instant and you can see as keenly as an eagle it's in your thinking that you are like eagles and when I read her lesson I realized that's our job at a Waldorf school to help children understand what it means to be a human being because that idea is under attack today our humanity is under attack I was involved with a group of educators and thinkers who were working with the Dalai Lama on a curriculum for compassion and one of the people who spoke was a psychologist who said that what we need today is a new definition of self she said it started with Freud when Freud said that our self was determined completely by sexual instincts he said and then it was further challenged by Skinner who made us think that our self was programmable and conditioned and then we were told that all that we do as self was chemically influenced and now we're being told that what we do is act as if we were computers the computer model now has been applied to our self but she said we need a new picture of self because we need to understand that our self is interconnected with everything that we are one with everyone around us the Native Americans knew that they knew the interconnectedness of all life how we have not taken advantage of their spiritual tradition is just a shame it's just a shame I read a story recently about a little Hopi girl who was interviewed by Robert Coles Robert Coles was a medical professor at Harvard who wanted to study the religious life of children and he went to the Hopi reservation he was there for weeks and eventually the one of the Hopi women said to him you're wasting your time here at school talking to these children and he said well, what do you mean she said because they won't talk to you here they leave who they really are behind when they come through the school doors so if you want to know what they really believe go to their homes so he went to the home of this Hopi girl and talked with her and her family and she said to him you know one of the things that our our Anglo teacher tells us is that her God lives in the in the sky up above the sky and then she asks me where does my God live and I can't tell her because I don't know so but our God is the sky and the earth and the Sun and the moon our God is all of these things and the people and she says but I said well why don't you he said why don't you tell the teacher because she would give me that smile I said, what smile is that the one that says oh you're cute kids but you're dumb so we say nothing we learned that long ago we say nothing to the Anglos and we pray for them right? the interconnectedness of everything do you know that Buffalo when they graze on the prairie secrete a chemical that makes grass grow better right? it's the interconnectedness of everything how do we teach our children that what we understand about the world is so limited we have to do it through imagination we have to do it by helping them see that the power of the natural world lives in them that's like a totem spirit animal isn't it to think that the eagle lives in us that's empowering 
to think that the strength of a lion lives in us, that courage, that the determination of a cow that can endlessly chill, chew green grass into white sweet milk, that lives in us. We have all that in us. We have to help children see that their humanity is potent with possibilities. They need this in the world. They really do. And they need to believe in people. If I were to say what my fear is now, my fear is that we have demythicized everyone to the point where we don't believe in anybody. Right? We go looking for every flaw in admirable people. You take Abraham Lincoln, perhaps the greatest president we've ever had in this country, and we just keep looking at his psychological makeup to find a flaw. You know, I remember being in college and the word iconoclastic was in vogue. But I had no idea that we would now live in a society that was entirely iconoclastic. Right? We pull everybody down. And the danger of that is our children cannot believe in anybody. We're raising children in a society that makes them cynical. And if we want to educate children in a spiritual way, we have to give them something to believe in people to believe in, to believe in the possibility that in a moment something new can enter our world. Right? The story I love to tell children is one about Martin Luther King. There was a man, let me see if I'm going to remember his name, he was a basketball player for Villanova. His name will come to me. This was in the 60s. Big, tall, strong, young African-American man. He wanted to come to Washington, D.C. to hear Martin Luther King speak. So he came down early by train. When he came here, he was standing on the mall waiting for the event to begin. And two men came up to him in suits and said, Sir, we want to ask you to help us today. Would you be a bodyguard for Dr. King? He was six foot six, strong, muscular, upright man. He said, yes, I would. So when Martin Luther King gave his famous speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, this young man stood right next to him. And George Raveling was his name. He ended up being an executive for Nike and uh, oh, was a college coach for a while. He stood there, and when Dr. King gave his speech, the I Have a Dream speech, he was right there. And at the end of the speech, Dr. King walks away. And George Raveling turns and says, Dr. King, you forgot your papers. And Martin Luther King says, oh, son, just keep them. Who knows? They might be worth something someday. <laughs> right? Nowhere on that paper did it say, I have a dream. Right? Most famous words. Moment of inspiration when the, something opens. Our children need to know that that's possible. George Raveling was offered a million dollars for those papers. He wouldn't sell them. Our children need to know there are people like that too. He donated them to a museum later. Our children need stories about people who do good, heroic things. They don't make our front page. It's up to us as parents and as teachers to find those stories so that our children have faith in humanity because we all know they see so much else every day that would give them a different impression. Right? We owe it to them to do this. Our schools can do this. And we can do this through the way we teach because the wonderful gift about being a Waldorf teacher is you get to talk to your children about the world. And in teaching them about the world, you get to teach them in a way that's academically sound. And that's the important thing, because we want it to be imaginative, we want it to be alive, but we want it to be substantive. When we do an experiment with children in chemistry, 
a simple experiment where you have a glass beaker about 10 inches high and in that beaker there's a candle that's lighted and burning and then next to it you have a glass pitcher and on the bottom of that pitcher you have about a half an inch of sodium bicarbonate and into that you pour acetic acid simple experiment and the whole thing effervesces and then the teacher dramatically but without saying anything holds that pitcher that effervescing mixture effervescent mixture and tilts the picture and then though the children see nothing in a few moments that candle goes out what the children then have to determine is what happened what was that effervescing what made that candle go out what gas is released when a substance bubbles like that I mean bubbles are fascinating because they surround this gas and then they pop and the gas is released and what kind of a gas is it that you can pour but not see and what makes it go in there I always think gases go up and around why is this one so heavy you see all of that in our study of carbon dioxide it's just the beginning but it should begin with wonder one of the things they say about geniuses is that they wonder they're amazed by the world that's why Einstein could find the theory of relativity he said all oh, my friends stop thinking about time and space but it just always interested me wonder we should keep alive that wonder it's hard to do in the, in the information age Right? but you do it with a little bit of drama in a simple experiment and then you push the children's thinking further you bring them things that stir them one of the things that interests me is what happens to children as they get older one of the things that I read and I really liked there was a story about a woman who was a teacher in a state school in Germany and what she noticed was that the children came to her school in first grade and they were alive and happy and you know their their pallor their the coloring in their cheeks showed you that they were healthy children and they were interested but when they left in eighth grade they didn't look like that at all and she thought oh my god is this what we do to children we dispirit them through education she said I'm not sure I want to be a teacher she went to a talk it was a talk by Rudolf Steiner and during the talk which was on another topic at some moment he stopped and digressed and turned in her direction and he said did you ever notice how a stream runs above the surface of the earth and then goes underground that stream is not lost that's what happens with children somewhere around the age of nine and ten something goes underground and so you have this underground stream and then it's the job of teachers to tap into that and when we tap into that or when the children bubble forth with interest then we know that we're touching into that part of them that's deep those questions and that's what should happen in the study of history yes they're going to write really clear compositions and they're going to write them accurately and they're going to punctuate them correctly and eventually Waldorf kids will learn to spell even with spell check right they will right but they're also going to get another lesson and it's one that stirs their heart depending on what you do whether it's the bombing of Hiroshima right or whether it's the presidency of Andrew Jackson whatever it is whether it's the Civil War we have to touch them on a deeper level because then we're teaching them in their hearts as well as we awaken their thinking because for the adolescent it's not that the world is beautiful it's not that the world is good they don't go there it's that the world be true they want to know what's true you see and their thinking is going to test that but it's our job to activate and engage their thinking and make them substantiate their opinions tell me why do you believe that 
Explain it. What does someone who believes something else think? Do two points of view. Right? When you ask them to write from two points of view, you test them. And that's what our teachers do. We test their thinking. Because that's as important as their feeling and then their doing. That's what we want. Now, I want to finish what I'm hoping to say, and I want to thank you for your patience. I want to finish with a little story. It's a first grade story. It's one that I was given when I first started teaching, back in 1973. First grade, I didn't have a first day story. We start teaching straight and curved, right? Form drawing, first lesson block in first grade. And this woman who was the second grade teacher gave me this story, it was a great one. And it's about a mother who looks out the door of her house and calls her daughter and says, would you bring your brother inside? He's starting school tomorrow and he needs to go and get a pair of straight and curved. And the little boy comes with his sister, she takes him by the hand, and he looks down at his feet and he's barefoot, he's been barefoot all summer. And she says, take him to the shoemaker and tell the shoemaker to make him a sister takes him along, they go down the street, they come to the shoemaker's shop, they open the door, the little bell above the door rings, the child goes in, and the girl says to the shoemaker who's there looking over his wire rim glasses, she said, my mother wants you to make my brother a pair of straight and curved. And the mother has given those instructions, the shoemaker hears them, he says, okay, please sit down. You go and he sits in that little chair that shoemaker shops used to have and he brings out two pieces of leather. One is a straight, stiff piece of leather. The other is a soft, supple piece of leather. He puts the straight, stiff piece under the child's foot and traces the foot, then traces the other. And he puts the soft, supple piece over the instep and he traces that. And then he says to the child, come back tomorrow and you're straight and curved. So the child skips out, glad to go back and play. The next day they return and they come through the door and the shoemaker looks up and smiles and says, please have a seat. And he comes out with two new shoes. And the little boy puts them on. And how many children go to first grade with new shoes? Right? And he walks across the floor to test them. And he just looks down at his feet the whole time, the way children do with new shoes. And the shoemaker says, now before you go, I want to show you something. And he brings him behind the counter and there's a box of old shoes, all worn out, where the uppers have separated from the soles and the child looks at them and they look like wild animals with mouths agape. And the shoemaker says, you see those shoes? Those shoes, they haven't been sewn together. Well, you must sew straight and curve together carefully in everything you do. That's a first grade story. But that's the Waldorf education. It's going to ask children to sew straight and curve. It's going to ask them to meld their intelligence with their heartfelt emotional thinking. They're going to ask them to be strong outwardly and inwardly. That's what I believe I see when I meet the graduates. I see young people who are clear thinking, who are can-do people, but who are warm-hearted. And teaching children in a way that helps them think clearly and warmly is going to make all the difference in our world. Because you see, as I do, that there are so many people in positions of influence who aren't doing that in business, in politics, in many places. Your children are going to help make a difference by the way they're being educated. They're educated to the fullness of their humanity. And that is a spiritual undertaking. So that's what I wanted to say to you tonight. And uh, I'm hoping that I haven't kept you too long and maybe there's some time for questions because your questions will help me remember what I forgot to say.
Thank you. Thank you.